On behalf of the NIOSH Future of Work Initiative, thank you for joining us for today's webinar, The Role of Robotics in the Future of Work. My name is Scott Hinn, and I will be your moderator. Before we get started, I'd like to let all of our attendees know that the NIOSH Future of Work Initiative, which was launched in 2019, and its corresponding work group have many ongoing and upcoming activities. The initiative launched its webinar series last year. Three webinars a year are hosted, each focused on one of our nine Future of Work priority topics. This is the fifth webinar in the series. You can view the recordings of the pre previous webinars on the NIOSH Future of Work Initiative website. Also, be sure to join us later on this year for one more webinar. If you would like to learn more about the series and the initiative, please visit our website. So let's, out, let's start out with our introductions. First, once again, my name is Scott Hinn. I'm an industrial hygienist at NIOSH in Cincinnati, Ohio. I've been with NIOSH for over 20 years. My research interests focus on national exposure and hazard surveillance and analyzing and managing large data sets of occupational exposures. I'm also a member of the NIOSH Future of Work Initiative Workgroup, and I will be your moderator. Your first speaker today will be Ms. Don Castillo. Don is the Director of, of the Division of Safety Research at NIOSH. She is also the NIOSH Manager for the Center for Occupational Robotics Research, the Center for Motor Vehicle Safety and a Traumatic Injury Prevention Program. She is an injury epidemiologist and has authored numerous articles, book chapters, and technical documents on a variety of occupational injury topics, including occupational injuries among young workers, older workers, firefighters, and workplace violence. Ms. Castillo received her Master of Public Health and Epidemiology from the University of California, Los Angeles. The second speaker today will be Dr. Chuma Naji. Chuma is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering at the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa. He holds a bachelor's degree in the building and building for, from Emo State University and an MBA from Oregon State University's College of Business and a master's and PhD degree in civil engineering from Oregon State University. His research focus is on generating foundational insight on human behavior, as well as formulating strategies and developing decision support tools that enhance construction safety and health, human machine interactions, construction automation, sustainable construction and workforce development in different construction environments. Chuma is also a member of the American Society of Civil Engineers, the American Society of Safety Professionals, the National Society of Black Engineers, and the Precast Concrete Institute. And with that, Dawn, thanks for joining us today, and I'll hand it over to you. Um, I very much appreciate the opportunity to be part of this webinar. Next slide. So to provide an orientation for where robotics lies within the NIOSH Future Work Initiative, this slide shows the three interconnected priority topics for the initiative. Workplace in red at the top, work in green in the middle, and workforce in orange at the bottom. And robotics is the subtopic for the work priority, addressing changes in how work is and will be done. Artificial intelligence and other technologies are included in this priority area and are integrated with robotics and not mutually exclusive. Next slide. So this is an outline for my presentation. I will discuss trends in the use of robots at work and the implications for worker safety and health, provide information about the NIOSH Center for Occupational Robotics Research, provide an overview of research needs identified by the center and our research portfolio, then end with what can be done to foster worker safety as robotics technology advances and robots become more commonplace. Next slide. So first, trends in occupational robots and implications for worker safety and health. Next slide. So this slide has data from the International Federation of Robotics. It shows that the number of robots being manufactured for industrial operations has grown steadily over the last decade, with more than 3 million robots available in 2020 across the world. Next slide. Most of these robots are traditional robots that have been used for decades for operations such as welding, painting, and assembly. Traditional robots are large, they're powerful, and they typically are kept separate from workers by cages or other engineering controls. Next slide. This physical separation of robots and human workers has been quite effective and traditional industrial robots have had a very good safety record. 
While there are challenges in identifying the numbers of workers killed and injured by robots, NIOSH did an analysis of fatality data using keyword searches that estimated 61 robot-related deaths between 1992 and 2015. This is less than 1% of the more than 190,000 workplace injury deaths during that time frame. Um, and we are currently updating these statistics. Next slide. This slide with data on robot sales shows that there is a small but growing market of a new type of robot, collaborative robot shown in purple, with sales of 22,000 collaborative robots in 2020. Next slide. This is a video of a collaborative robot. They are not confined to cages. They are designed to work alongside and in collaboration with human workers. New types of worker protection strategies are being developed for these new types of robots, such as limiting the force of any impacts between the human and the robot. Next slide. Robotics technology is also being designed to be worn by workers to reduce the physical stress of demanding tasks and augment worker strength. And these are termed exoskeletons and exosuits. Next slide. Robots are also being created for specialized industrial applications and operating in a shared space with humans. This includes drones used for inspections of structures and equipment, use of autonomous machines in agricultural operations, and the piloting of driverless commercial trucks on US roadways. Next slide. Service robots are a type of robot designed specifically to assist humans, and they typically operate in a shared space with humans. This slide shows the top five selling service robots for professional use, with sales in 2019 in green and sales in 2020 in purple. The largest sales of service robots were in transportation and logistics, personal cleaning, medical robotics, hospitality, and agriculture. Next slide. Advances in artificial intelligence will lead to more decision-making and autonomy by robots. Next slide. While the technology that's being developed is remarkable and it holds promise for enhancing productivity and safety, it is critical that we be proactive and vigilant to ensure that worker safety and health is addressed. Technologies are developing rapidly and human factors are not always considered in the design and applications. Additionally, workplaces and workers are complex, and it is hard to anticipate all contingencies and develop fail-safe equipment and systems. The following case study shows how things can go wrong despite very sophisticated equipment and controls. Next slide. This case involved a death in 2015 that was investigated by the NIOSH-supported Washington State Fatality Assessment and Control Evaluation Program. This is a picture of the driverless forklift involved in the incident. The forklift was used to move pallets of water bottles and automatically navigated around the warehouse using a system of vehicle mounted lasers and reflectors that were positioned throughout the warehouse. The forklift had safety sensors designed to detect objects or workers in the vehicle path. When a sensor detected an obstacle, the forklift would stop moving and an alarm would sound until a worker removed the obstacle. The manufacturer's manual requires a worker to initiate an emergency stop before removing an obstacle, and the forklift would then need to be manually reset to start again. Shown on the right are strips of plastic wrap, often torn off of pallets during loading and unloading that were known to stick to the forks and to be seen as an obstacle by the forklift. Investigators believe that the worker attempted to remove a piece of plastic from under the elevated forks without first initiating an emergency stop, that he was likely bending or kneeling under the forks outside of the safety sensor field, and that when he removed the plastic, the forklift reset, bringing the elevated forks down, crushing him against the wheel cover of the vehicle. Next slide. Advances in occupational robotics technology have the potential to improve worker safety, but there are also concerns that these new technologies can contribute to worker injuries. Occupational robots can improve worker safety by expanding the use of robots for dangerous work, removing the need for workers to be in harm's way, and by augmenting workers' abilities. 
However, increased interaction between humans and robots has the potential to result in injuries. The new types of robots will require refined and new protection strategies. There are concerns that rapid advances in technology will outpace standard setting. And finally, increased use of robotics and concerns about job displacement may contribute to worker stress. Next slide. This slide gives examples of how different technologies hold both potential to reduce hazardous exposures to workers, as well as to potentially introduce hazards. Traditional robots can do work that's hazardous to human workers, such as welding. However, there's also the potential for workers to be injured from unintended contact with the machinery. This can occur during maintenance and when safety controls are subverted for the sake of expedience or productivity. Mobile robots hold promise for reducing hazards to human workers during disaster response. However, there's also the potential for unintended contact with workers and ignition of explosive atmospheres. Exoskeletons hold promise for reducing wear and tear on human bodies from heavy lifting, awkward postures, and repetitive motions. But they have the potential to introduce hazards from unintended loading on other parts of the body, restriction of motion, and impacts on balance. Drones hold promise for reducing hazards associated with inspections, particularly at heights, which present fall risks to workers, but they have the potential to hurt workers from unintended contact, from drone operator error or malfunctions of the drone. Additionally, the use of drones around human workers has the potential to distract them and contribute to injuries from inattention or loss of balance. Next slide. NIOSH established the Center for Occupational Robotics Research in September 2017 in response to the rapid growth in occupational robots and wanting to be proactive in addressing worker safety and health. Next slide. The center was formed to provide scientific leadership to guide the use of occupational robots that enhance worker safety, health, and well being. Next slide. The center is a virtual rather than a brick and mortar center. It provides strategic direction for and coordinates robotics related work across the Institute's campuses and divisions. Researchers have a range of expertise, including epidemiology, industrial hygiene, engineering, and organizational psychology. And the center is encompassed within the NIOSH Future of Work Initiative. Next slide. The center uses a broad definition of robotics and encompasses multiple technologies. We address both traditional industrial robots, such as those that work in robotic cells and cages away from human workers, and emerging robotics technologies, such as collaborative robots, mobile robots, wearable robotics, powered exoskeletons, autonomous vehicles, drones, and future robots that through artificial intelligence will have increased autonomy. Next slide. This slide shows the various activities the center is engaged in. They include monitoring trends in injuries, evaluating robotics technologies as sources of and as interventions for workplace injuries and illnesses, establishing risk profiles of robotic workplaces, identifying research needs and conducting research, supporting the development and adoption of consensus standards which serve as best practices, and developing and communicating guidance and best practices. Before moving on to describe our research activities, I'd like to touch on, next slide, our participation in standards committees. Consensus-based standards serve as best practices. We're actively engaged in several standards committees for a couple of purposes. One is to bring our expertise and add voice to occupational safety and health discussions and considerations. Second, our participation helps us identify research needs that we might fill to advance the work of these committees. We participate on the American National Standards Institute or ANSI committee working to update the industrial robots and robot system safety standard, including updates to address advances in collaborative robot safety. We participate on the new ANSI standard released in late 2020 on mobile robot safety. And we participate on the International Standards Organization Robotics Committee, whose deliberations are often adopted and integrated into the aforementioned ANSI standards. 
We are participating on an underdevelopment ASTM standard for exoskeletons and exosuits. And we contributed input on worker safety and health on two documents that are not standards per se, but they're related. We provided input on the need for worker safety and health on a roadmap for future standards related to drones. And we contributed to an ANSI American Society of Safety Professionals and National Safety Council document providing best practices for managing occupational fleets with partially and fully automated vehicles. Next slide. I would now like to share with you occupational robotics research needs that we've identified and an overview of our growing research portfolio. Next slide. NIOSH interest in robotics related research are included in our strategic plan for fiscal years 2019 to 2024. The strategic plan is organized by health outcomes and robotics related research is included in sections on traumatic injury prevention, musculoskeletal health, immune infectious dermal disease and healthy design and well-being. Within each of these health outcomes, priority research is identified by industry sector, for example, agriculture or construction, based on consideration of the burden or potential burden on workers, such as large numbers of injuries, the specific need for the research and the potential of the research to move the needle to better protect workers. These goals guide both intramural and extramural research. Thus, in internal NIOSH competitions for research funds, proposals must address goals in the plan. Extramural researchers are also encouraged to identify goals addressed by their proposals when submitting investigator-initiated grant applications to NIOSH. Next slide. The four types of research conducted by NIOSH are summarized on this slide along with how they relate to occupational robotics research. We conduct surveillance research to improve the ability to identify and track injuries and fatalities involving robotics. We conduct basic or etiologic research to increase our understanding of human and robot interactions and identify risk factors for injury. We conduct intervention research to identify opportunities to better protect worker safety and health using robotics. This includes evaluations of robots as interventions and evaluation of risk control strategies to reduce robot-related injuries. And finally, we conduct translation research to evaluate aids and barriers to implementing research findings and best practices. Next slide. The goals in the strategic plan are written broadly. More detailed research needs can be found on the robotics research webpage and the NIOSH Future Work Research Agenda published late last year. Next slide. As I noted previously, the center was established in late 2017. We are in the process of building up our research portfolio. Research is a time consuming endeavor, including time to develop and peer review research protocols and time for review and approval by human subjects research boards and sometimes the Office of Management and Budget. As well, the pandemic has contributed to delays in research starts and research being finalized and findings disseminated. We, this, thus, much of our research is in the startup phase or in progress. We have a small but growing portfolio of research conducted by our scientists within NIOSH and researchers in academia. This research ranges from small and pilot studies to larger scale studies. Next slide. With respect to extramural research, we fund research through several mechanisms. We fund seven state programs to investigate some worker related fatalities and a couple of these state programs have identified fatalities involving robotics as priority for investigations. The case study that I presented earlier on the driverless forklift was from the Washington state based program. NIOSH funds investigator initiated research and NIOSH supported centers such as education and research centers, the National Construction Center and Centers for Agricultural Safety and Health have included robotics related research in their research portfolios. After my presentation, you will be hearing from Dr. Nuja about research he's done with funding from an ERC and the National Construction Center. NIOSH's mining program uses contracts to support priority mining research. And for the last few years, NIOSH has partnered with the National Science Foundation to include occupational robotics research needs in the National Robotics Initiative Funding Opportunity Announcement. Next slide. 
NIOSH supported research includes projects addressing multiple technologies, including traditional robots, collaborative robots, mobile robots, remote controlled robots, drones, and exoskeletons. Our research projects address applications in several industry sectors, including agriculture, construction, manufacturing, mining, and healthcare. The majority address the prevention of musculoskeletal or traumatic occupational injuries. We have one project funded in partnership with the National Science Foundation that includes the use of robotics to prevent the transmission of infectious diseases to healthcare workers. I've provided the link to the page on our center website that includes an inventory of our research projects. Next slide. So we've discussed that increasing use of new robotics technologies is part of the future of work and that there are numerous knowledge gaps. I would now like to discuss what can be done to keep workers safe in the interim as we seek to fill these knowledge gaps. Next slide. First, NIOSH encourages robotics manufacturers and those who integrate robots into work environments to follow prevention through design principles to engineer safety into the robots and work systems. We encourage the development of best practices by consensus standards groups and others. And we encourage employers and workers to follow these best practices. Next slide. On this slide, I show a few examples of recently developed best practices. OSHA recently updated its technical manual chapter on industrial robot systems and industrial robot system safety. This chapter was updated through an OSHA alliance with the Association for Advancing Automation and NIOSH, and it includes up-to-date technical information on the hazards associated with industrial and emergent robot applications. It includes safety considerations for employers and workers and risk assessment methods and risk reduction measures. This chapter serves to guide OSHA compliance officers as they perform inspections at facilities with robotic systems. And it provides a technical resource for safety and health professionals overseeing the use of robotic systems in workplaces. At the bottom of the slide are two best practices developed by researchers who completed small studies funded by the National Construction Center. Dr. Naji will be discussing the protocol for assessing human robot interaction safety risks in his presentation, which is coming up. The second example is a practical model for measuring and mitigating safety risks of using unmanned aerial systems in construction. Next slide. The NIOSH webpage for the Robotic Center includes these products as well as additional resources such as NIOSH science blogs, case reports, and peer reviewed articles. Next slide. In summary, occupational robots will increasingly be used across industries and have new functions and increased autonomy. Research and work to develop best practices for working safely with robots are needed to position the occupational safety and health community to proactively address the proliferation of robotics technologies that are a significant component of the work, future of work. Next slide. Thank you so much for your interest in our work and attention to my presentation. I've included my contact info on this slide as well as our center's website address. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Um, another reminder, if you have any questions, please drop those in the Q&A. We'll be answering those at the end of the session. Okay, uh, next up we have Dr. Chuma Naji. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I wanna thank Don for setting up the stage perfectly. Um, on the topic of you know using robots in occupational settings. Um, I've already been introduced, Chumar Naji, an assistant professor in the Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. I direct the Construction Innovation Integration Lab um, at the university as well. So as Don already mentioned earlier, I'm gonna be going through two projects that um, were sponsored through NIOSH, but again, going through two other entities, a regional um, center for occupational safety and health, and also the center that handles construction related um, safety research. The very first project is looking at uh, the role that exoskeletons can play or how they will interact um, with temperature when being used for, for construction activities. Um, the second is about the protocol that Don also mentioned um, for assessing human-robot interaction um, when looking at safety risks. 
So um, again, this presentation, I'm going to go a little bit quick, um, but, it, but I'll do my best to cover as much as possible. But however, feel free to reach out to me via email if you have additional questions about um, or if you want resources uh, within the domains that I'm going to be covering over the next 20 minutes or so. So first off, um, the whole idea of wearable robots um, in being used for occupational settings is, is not a new idea. Um, it's been there for a while, but now it's getting into some of the specific domains like construction, agriculture, and manufacturing. So we have a decent number of wearable devices that are commercially available, and we also have some that are currently under you know, production or development. When we talk about exoskeletons or wearable robots or exosuits, um, they typically fall into two um, broad categories. They are either going to be seen as passive or they will be seen as active. Um, the active devices are more responsive overall um, to the human, while the passive just consistently provides a level of support using a mechanical system typically made up of um, strings, actuators, and um, relying on gravity to provide support. Um, exoskeletons can support different body parts. Most times we, um, it's, it's been used for more of upper body support, but it does also provide support for you know, lower body as well or full body. And this table just provides us the snapshot of the different exoskeletons that are, um, that are out there in the market right now. Now, you know, several folks have said that, you know, using exoskeletons or robotics in general actually does, you know, provide benefits overall to construction workers or, you know, workers in different industries, which is, which is true. Um, but what we don't really know at this point is how these technologies will perform within specific contexts, contexts such as doing work outdoors in, uh, in hot temperatures, which is something that is typical in construction and maybe uh, mining and maybe agriculture as well. So this study here is looking at, you know, how we can assess the performance of exoskeletons, given the high incidence rate that we typically have uh, that are tied to um, heat related illnesses. Would exoskeleton help workers perform better? Would it actually, um, like um, Don mentioned, would it actually be introducing more of a risk that makes it worse when you are, or when it's being used in, in higher temperatures. So to, to test the, the, our idea or starting hypothesis that actually, you know, exoskeletons can perform at a high level, regardless of the temperature, uh, we set up a, an experiment, um, which was for drilling specifically. And uh, we developed a platform for synchronizing different types of data that are more physiological facing um, to help us objectively assess how exoskeletons perform when they when workers are or people are exposed to different temperatures. Okay, so um, for this particular uh, pilot study, we had four conditions that we tested. Uh, the first condition was, you know, relatively speaking, room temperature. And uh, we also looked at a temperature that was, I would consider a high temperature, about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And we tried to keep the, the lab space at about 50% um, humidity. And we did that for both the conditions where we had people use the exoskeletons for the, for, for the drilling activity and conditions where they did not have to use the exoskeletons. We had folks drill. Uh, continuously into the wrong that we developed for about 15 minutes. And we, were, we asked them to be as precise as possible. And we, we developed a process of collecting error data as well um, through the experimental apparatus. Um, the types of data that we collected were around muzzle activation. And we used EMG to collect the data for muzzle activation. Uh, we captured muzzles and two primary muzzles, the anterior deltoid and the posterior deltoid. And we did that on the left side and the right side um, of, you know, of right hand and left hand of the, of, of the folks who participated in the study. So just showing a picture of like the setup, you know, the anterior deltoid and the posterior deltoid and uh, uh, one of the participants who stopped by the lab to test a particular or to work with a particular exoskeleton. Um, we also assessed the perceived exertion um, which folks refer to it as the ROE Borg scale. And again, this is just determining or asking participants to tell us how they feel 
as they go through the experiment. Also, we looked at the comfort level as part of the assessments that were slightly more subjective because they were done using a, a, a survey, a questionnaire survey. We also captured the error rates, like I mentioned earlier, using uh, the, the wrong, the apparatus that we developed, and uh, that was looking at how many times the bit struck the, the, the sides of the, the hole that we created in the wrong. So looking at some of the results, um, let's start with the, the error rates that we, that we captured during the drilling activity. And what we saw was that um, when, the, when, we had, when we had participants exposed to a um, hotter temperature, um, they were having more errors compared to when you know, they were in room temperature, which you would, which you would kind of like expect because you're, you're getting tired faster, you're getting strapped in of the temperature. So we saw higher error rates. However, when we introduced the exoskeleton, we saw a slight decrease uh, within, um, with regards to the error rates in the hot temperature. So it was um, the errors increased overall, but with the exoskeleton condition, we saw a slight you know, dip in the error rate. So the error rate reduced when folks were working with the exoskeleton in um, hot temperature. One thing I forgot to mention earlier is that the, the folks we used in this study as was, was, was the first phase, was a pilot study, we focused mainly on you know, construction students um, with, um, within our program at Alabama and not um, the construction workers who were out there. However, the folks who came in typically had experience with, with um, drilling activities, just to be, to be clear. So when looking at the muzzle activation, we, we, we normalized the EMG data following you know, the filtration processes and so forth. I won't bore you with all those details. But uh, what, what we have here in this particular slide and shows us that th there wasn't like a significant difference when we checked the results uh, for the width and without the exoskeleton condition when we um, in room temperature for the anterior deltoid and the posterior deltoid for the left side and for the right side. It was pretty, was pretty close, okay? Uh, but we could see a slight reduction in muscle activation for the left side posterior deltoid and for the right side anterior deltoid. And we saw the opposite for the posterior deltoid right side anterior deltoid left side. So again, but again, it wasn't a big change per se. So what we could take out from what we could take away from this slide is that um, the exo did not necessarily um, impact the activation you know, significantly um, in room temperature. Now, looking at the, the hotter condition, um, we could see that you know, for all four muzzles that we captured or groups that we captured, that there actually was a drop uh, when we look at the width exoskeleton condition. Um, while it's not significant you know, to a level of a p-value 0.05, it was, it was slightly less than that. Uh, but we could see that you know, looking at the figure that there was a better drop compared to the you know, room temperature condition. Now we only had 15 minutes um, for the experiment and we could hypothesize that if we had extended um, the experiment longer, you would actually see that the exoskeleton would um, play a bigger role in, in helping to ensure that the muscle activation is, uh, doesn't drop significantly. Now looking at the more the subjective measure that we use, which was the, the Berg um, scale, we, we asked folks to tell us you know, at the beginning and at the end of the experiment how they feel in the, the rate of perceived exertion. And um, in this particular slide, you can see that um, in the hot condition, um, the participants actually felt more exerted with the exoskeleton compared to the without exoskeleton. Now again, this is primarily looking at discomfort. Uh, one of the issues we have with exoskeletons is that they, are, uh, in most cases, provide you with limited mobility, which could also impact your level of comfort. So um, while this is subjective in terms of how we got the data, it also tells us that while the technology might be great in terms of reducing muscle activation, it does have some um, the negative perception when looking at exertion. So again, the issue of using exoskeleton is not something that is going to be down to does it work in terms of improving productivity. We have to look at it from a more holistic picture because there are multiple factors that goes into ensuring that workers use these devices the right way and use them safely as well. 
Um, the second project I'm going to be going through real quick for the next seven minutes is looking at um, developing tools that could help us better mitigate um, risks that are introduced or enhanced uh, when we have a, a robot and a human, you know, working together uh, or working within the same space. Um, and to do that, we need, you know, tools, we need resources. Uh, in the absence of those resources, something could go wrong. But when we do have those resources, it's easier for us to better manage, better plan, and hopefully um, prevent the accidents from occurring because we have good controls in place. So again, this study focused on, hey, what are those good controls? What are the significant concerns of safety risks for different types of robots and how do we pair the different um, risk mitigation strategies to the different um, safety risks and come up with solutions that ensure that workers within the construction domain for specific tasks can end up doing the work, working with robots and be safe at the end of the day. So that's what we focused on in this study. This study was supported by the CPWR. So the resources developed through this study are currently online and you folks would have access to them if you want to go through the report. So for to, so to, to develop the resources, we went through a multi-phase um, process. Uh, we started by first of all, identifying several hazards that can be affiliated with the use of robots in occupational settings and uh, one of the documents that we actually referenced was the older version of the OSHA's um, guide that they had out. And I think Don also referenced that particular um, resource as well. So we looked at that, we looked at several documents that were industry facing and also academic literature to identify the different hazards and also the, the strategies that can be used to prevent, uh, the, 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 and also to identify strategies that could be used to prevent issues around human-robot interactions. Uh, after that, we went forward to identify different experts and we used the Delphi process to help us derive the insight. And the, the Delphi process is simply um, some sort of a focus group where you have multiple experts working together um, to iteratively derive knowledge that is less um, bias, because now you're relied on the collective rather than just um, a one round of, of surveys, but you're doing multiple rounds, iterating as you go through with the goal of reducing the bias and coming up with more objective insights. So we had 29 experts uh, participate in this panel across industry and, and academia, and they helped us develop the different skills we use to assess high and low level of safety risk, and also to figure out which risks are going to be critical for different tasks. We looked at three tasks um, in this study. We looked at brick laying, we looked at concrete um, finishing, and uh, we looked at drywall hanging. And again, it was all within construction. And we also looked at three categories of technologies of robots. We looked at um, wearable robots. We assessed you know, the remote control, which is gonna be your drones and your unmanned ground vehicles. And we looked at the single task robots, which would be like your brick laying robots and so forth. So we, we identified 40 critical ha 40 hazards um, that are introduced or enhanced by the use of robotic and, and automation in construction operations. Like I said, we broke it down to three levels of RAs. So that's your wearable robot, remote operated robot, and your single task or on-site automated robotic systems. We were able to classify the, the hazards into seven groups. Again, we're guided primarily by OSHA's um, standard or what they have right now as a resource for you know um, preventing accidents related to human robots interaction so we have those seven groups then we also identified potential strategies for mitigating them again all this information is provided in the cpwr report now this table just summarizes some of the high risks um, that we identified for wearable robots and again, for a drywall installation. So this is a specific task for the use of wearable robots. We went through three tasks in the report that's available, uh, but in this particular application for drywall installation, we can see here that um, limited mobility, which is something that Don talked about earlier as well, is a, what was seen as a significant concern um, for the experts that participated in this in the study, it was, was rated as one of the higher um, safety risks. We also look at discomfort, again, was, was rated as a high risk. 
Then you have you know, improper equipment tool used by the worker, mechanical part failure, uh, which again ties into one of the issues that Don talked about in the case study when the mechanical system doesn't function as it should. That was, a, that, that, that was for a single task robot, but in this context, again, it's still a high risk for when looking at wearable or robots or exoskeletons. This slide just shows um, the critical safety risks that were identified for the different um, tasks that we looked into for drywall installation, brick laying, and for concrete grinding and polishing. Um, we identified different critical safety risks. Some of the risks were um, somewhat consistent, um, like mechanical part failure, uh, but others were not because, again, the different tasks would likely have different risks and uh, would have different levels of those risks as well. But the major sources of risk, remember, we had seven sources, but the major sources of risk were tied to the mechanical system, were tied to the worker of the human, things like distraction. Then you look at the control system for the different robots that we assessed. Again, these were the three main categories. Then when looking at mitigation strategies, we have different types. Uh, we have those that you can implement before you even start the work. So more design oriented strategies. I know Don mentioned, okay, using prevention through design strategies to design the robots. But we could also use prevention through design strategies to design the workspace to ensure that when you do have robots and the workers working together, you have limited problems because you, you know, you thought about it and you created a space that was conducive to such operations. And we also have a list of other um, implementation strategies or strategies that you could implement to help, you know, reduce the risks associated with the use of robots. Um, we created different resources. We have a robotic system manual, assessment manual, which provides insight on the key fact, the key safety risks the different um, robots that are out there for construction operations. Um, so the strategies that could be used to prevent the, the different safety risks. We also created a safety protocol, more like a JHA that could be used by you know, foremen on the job sites if they are interacting with the different types of robots for the, for the tasks that we worked on. Um, this, this, these materials are online, they are available, and you could use that thanks to you know, support from NIOSH and the, the, the uh, regional center and CPWR. And the last resource there is an online tool that we also put together uh, to help you know, folks who have to you know, assess the risk levels of you know, using different robots on the, on the job site, something that's easier to use. Okay, so kind of like in summary, um, as Don already mentioned, you know, we have several technologies coming out, you know, when um, looking at robots, exoskeletons and single task robots, you know, these, these technologies are, are, are here and we believe they're here to stay, but they do have some risks attached to them. So we, we, need to be we need to be prepared for the future. We need to have the resources to understand how and when to implement these technologies to, uh, to guarantee the safety of our workers and also the efficiency of the work process. So yeah, so that's my presentation for today and some of my references. I believe this is gonna be online at some point. So you folks feel free to, to look at this. And um, yeah, if you have any question, feel free to reach out to me. My email is provided and, um, and that's it. I'm gonna move, I'm gonna pass it on to Scott. Thank you, Chuma. So uh, we are right on schedule here and we're gonna enter our Q&A portion. We have about 13 minutes here. Um, so please, if you have any questions, please drop those in the Q&A. Um, and so the first question, uh, this will be for Don, is NIOSH partnering with academic robotics groups and or sharing the research needs and ensuring worker health and safety and wellness? Thanks, Scott. So yes, we are partnering with academic robotics groups as well as um, industry partners. We could not do what we are doing without the, the support and leveraging the expertise and resources of others. We've got some memorandums of understanding partnership agreements with a few universities such as North Carolina State University, University of Florida, University of Wisconsin-Madison. And the, the scope of those partnership agreements is to support collaborative research as well as to provide experiential opportunity, learning opportunities for students. And with respect to sharing the research needs with academic groups, um, yes, we have them on our website, but we've also presented them at um, different forms. For example, the National Robotics Initiative has an annual meeting of robotics investigators, and we've shared information um, to that group. 
And then the, um, the other thing I'll note is that we've also got some examples where our staff provide input to research that's funded either through NIOSH or through other groups, such as the National Science Foundation. Thanks, Don. Uh, Chuma, the next question is for you. Um, so you mentioned earlier about active and passive exoskeletons. If you could go into a little bit more detail on the advantages and disadvantages of, of each of those. Uh, great. Um, so for the, let, let's start with the passive exoskeleton. So most times it, they will be cheaper uh, because the, the system itself is more straightforward. It's reliant on less electronics. Um, however, it's less responsive to the walker. So it's providing you with a fixed level of support. So you could see that, you could, you could guess that the um, discomfort level might be a, a little bit higher, okay? Now, you have those systems readily available in the market. Um, if you look at the list I provided in the slides, you see that most of them were actually passive exoskeletons and not necessarily active exoskeletons. Now, when we flip it to the active exoskeletons, again, there are fewer in the market. They are more expensive because they are, you know, smarter systems overall, and uh, they would usually um, help, or we would, we could argue, I've not tested it, as a, and as a, as a researcher, I have to be careful with what I say, but you could argue that it's going to be more effective because it's more responsive to the human than when you just have the active, um, so that when you have the, just a passive exoskeleton. So, uh, so those are. I would consider the major um, differences in terms of operations and uh, usability. Thanks, Juma. Uh, next question we have will be for Don. Uh, please comment on the safety risks and risk prevention to workers and to the public for autonomous robotic vehicles, drones, and humanoid robots. For example, the Tesla bot. Yeah, so one of the things I note is that the technology that's being developed is really, really remarkable. But we're also talking in situations where we're putting that technology into a shared space with humans and humans are, are not always predictable and humans and, and different environments are complex. So it's really important that we proactively try to identify the risks, such as the work that um, Dr. Naji had done with, with his external experts. And for us to be you know, really vigilant and recognize that we can't we, we have to be concerned about over-reliance on the technology. We've seen a number of um, incidents with the automated you know, autopilots within cars and vehicles and something goes wrong in the programming. There's not all the contingencies that have been planned for. So there's um, a tremendous amount of work ahead for us. And then I'll just make an additional comment on the humanoid robot. So one of the, the issues with those are that when you make the robot look like a human you run the risk of human workers over-interpreting um, what the capabilities are of that robot, whether or not they can perceive like a human can perceive, whether or not they can have empathy like a human does. And so those are some uh, additional considerations for the, the humanoid robots. Thank you, Don. Uh, next question for Chuma. Okay, in the present study, you utilize students as the sample population. Would the outcome change significantly if real construction workers were used? Um, great question. So I would say it could change, but we don't know until we actually test um, or we do conduct experiments using, you know, construction workers. But one thing I, I would also highlight is that most of the folks who were participating in the study were, largely speaking, healthy young people. Okay. Now, when you have folks who are older, you know, maybe not as healthy as well what you would see is that the level of activation, when you're looking at the, the muscle activation specifically, the, the level of activation will be different because you know, healthier workers have better regulation for their muscles than, on, than people who are not that healthy. So the, I, I could argue again, but we need data to prove that, that for folks who are in a lesser, or in a less, you know, for folks who are not in the best physical state, the EXO might be able to even provide better value overall. Uh, but again, I, I'm not saying this conclusively. Uh, I'm saying this as a, as a hypothesis that we can test in the future um, when we want to evaluate it. But one of the difficulties we would always have in research is convincing construction workers to actually leave the job sites and come to the lab to do the experiment. Uh, but in the future, we, we, we hope that we'll be able to achieve that. Thanks. Thanks, Juma. 
Uh, next question for Don. Uh, what role have occupational robots played during the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, so there are a number of examples of robots being used to address manufacturing challenges that were associated with the pandemic, as well as helping to prevent harmful exposures of workers. Um, examples include use of robotics to manufacture personal protective equipment and cloth face coverings that was brought on um, when we were dealing with the, the supply shortages. And then also use of robotics equipment to disinfect work, workplaces. Um, the pandemic sparked a considerable amount of research that may come to bear for future applications. And one example is the project that I mentioned that we funded in partnership with the National Robotics Initiative to develop an intuitive interface to allow nurses to conduct some patient tasks remotely, which would help reduce their exposure to the virus. So a few examples, but it does appear that the pandemic did spawn some additional applications and interest in use of robotics in workplaces. Thanks, Don. Uh, another question for you, Don, is uh, do you have any tips or resources on how to communicate to concerned or hesitant employees about occupational robots? Yeah, so the introduction of robots to the workplace can be concerning to employees. Um, they may not understand the purpose of the robot. They may not ha have concerns about how to work safely with the robot, and they may be concerned with the robot replacing them or, or coworkers. So it's really important to engage employees up front so that they understand what the robotics technology brings to the workplace and the positive impacts for the work that they do, um, which might include removing them from some tedious or, or dangerous work and freeing them up for more challenging and rewarding tasks. It's also important to engage them in pilots so that they can provide their expertise on how best to integrate the technology into their work and that they're part of the process. One of the things that Dr. Naji noted is issues with, with comfort for the exoskeleton. So it's important that you take the perceptions and the experiences of the workers into consideration as you begin to integrate the robotics um, into the workplace. And then finally, it's really important to provide employees with training on what the robot does and does not do. For example, how the robot senses, and we, we talked about the humanoid robots or does not sense employee actions and then protocols for working safely with the robot so that the, the employees are fully familiar with the risk mitigation measures and why they're so important. Thanks, Don. Uh, Chuma, um, what hazards were rated as the most critical safety risk for each RA and across each construction task? And you're on mute. Uh, sorry about that. So when, you, when we look at the different construction tasks um we we could see that uh let me let me let me check this so things around worker mobility was a concern for the for all the tasks when looking at exoskeleton that was for sure um they, there were also issues around a mechanical part failure and i think one of the examples that we discussed um, with the experts was that okay you could put all the device and you start doing work now, after a while, maybe it could get tired depending on the type of exoskeleton that you're using. Then how do you actually deal with that? You'd have to stop work, which is loss in productivity. Then you have to try to re re um, reorganize the system or you just keep working that way. And, you, and um, because you don't want to lose productivity, but the worker ends up living with blisters or something like that. So um, those, were those were concerns that were raised across all the tasks when you're looking at um, exoskeletons. But when looking at the, the robots, um, the single task robots and, um, the, and, the, and the drones, which are remote operated robots, um, issues around mechanical failure, um, mechanical part failure rose to the very, to the very top. Um, also looking at, you know, inadequate work task designs um, for um, the on-site single task robots. That was also brought up as well as, um, as issues that could lead to um, a significant negative outcome. Okay, thanks. So we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Um, uh, so the next one, Don, um, what are some of the common challenges that employers face regarding robots and how can these challenges be overcome? 
Yeah, so one challenge is simply sifting through the variety of the new robots and identifying those that will enhance your operations to, to focusing on what needs to be done and looking at the robot to do that rather than necessarily you know, looking at this new exciting technology and trying to figure out how to put it into your workplace. And then a second challenge is integrating the technology into the operations and doing so in a fashion that's embraced by employees and in a fashion that's safe. Um, pilots, including those that actively engage employees on how they are rolled out are a good idea to help work out the kinks and to engage employees. And then it is critical that thorough risk assessments be completed to identify potential risks to human workers and that control strategies be put in place. Um, these risk assessments need to be considered not just for the equipment, but the environment and the system in which the robotics equipment will work. And then the consensus-based standards that I had referenced earlier, um, those are, are good places to look for you know, those risk assessment measures and control strategies. And then the final thing I'll note is that there are certified integrators who are thoroughly trained in risk assessments and controls that can be brought into um, the workplace to ensure that the integration of the robot is done in a, in a safe and holistic fashion. Thanks, Don. Okay, so that's all the time we have for today. Uh, another warm thanks to Don and Chuma for their thoughtful presentations, to Kiana Harper for her logistical support, and to all our attendees for joining the NIAS Future of Work Initiatives webinar on the role of robotics in the future of work. Again, be sure to visit our website to stay abreast of our NIAS Future of Work Initiative activities and forthcoming webinars. Until we meet again, stay safe, healthy, and well. Goodbye. <laughs>